Thomas Baldrick here at ASH 2014 in San Francisco. Happy to have with us again a familiar face. He is Dr. Guillermo Garcia Monero from the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's talk about your phase two trial with uh, azacitidine plus azacitidine and varinostat for patients with newly diagnosed AML or high risk MDS. Thank you, Thomas, for this opportunity. This is a very interesting study. So basically, as you know, uh, most clinical trials exclude people that have some degree of comorbidities, they have poor performance, they have some other disease. And in leukemia, in my opinion, this sometimes doesn't make sense because many times what we see is that, uh, let's say you have kidney dysfunction or liver dysfunction. It is possible that this is somehow related to the leukemia. Yet, you're excluding patients from these trials because they don't qualify for these trials and then they blame the FDA. Well, the FDA says you have to do that in people with good performance and good kidney function, good liver function. And, and then I said, well, but this doesn't make any sense because in a way it's a tautology, it's like a circular concept. It's like, well, you are not treating the patients that need to be treated. Mm -hmm. So a number of years ago, we performed what I think actually is a in very interesting study where now hopefully uh, submitting this uh, study for publication where we said, well, let's challenge this concept. Let's do a trial that is specific for patients that do not qualify for clinical trials. Let's just try to challenge the status quo. And we did a small study with 30 patients and we found actually that indeed you can treat this kind of patients. So these are people that have a history of cancer, they have poor performance, they may have some other disease like heart disease or liver disease. And we selected two drugs, esacitidine and borinostat, that we know we can deliver because these are not very intensive agents. And the results, in my opinion, were spectacular. You know, we could induce responses, these patients tolerated therapy. And in this study, actually, we showed that the survival of these patients was longer than expected. So when we had this data, we thought, well, this is a small pilot trial of 30 patients. What do we do next? So we designed the study that is going to be presented uh, uh, as a poster session. Uh, I don't know if it's today or tomorrow, but where we basically randomized between esacitidine and or the second drug, Borinostat. So here the question is, was two. One is, is it possible really that we can treat this kind of patients? Because maybe the first 30 patients were an artifact, you know, maybe. And second, if we're gonna do that, beyond exposing these patients that are already suffering a lot because of these other problems, plus the maladysplastic syndrome or leukemia, can we learn whether the addition of Borinostat uh, helps in terms of the response rate. And this is, has been, uh, these doublets have been controversial, a little bit difficult to, to demonstrate. The data that we show is very interesting. We treated um, around 80 patients on, on this randomized uh, uh, extension study. And uh, first of all, we clearly show that you can treat this kind of patients with esacitidine and borinostat. This to me is very important because the message for the community and for the FDA or whoever is actually, there is probably very little reason to to make these uh, uh, restrictions in terms of who can or cannot be treated on a clinical trial. Our studies suggest very strongly that you can treat people with some degree of renal failure, some degree of liver failure, that if you have poor performance, you should be able to treat someone like that, that if you have a history of, let's say, breast cancer, but this breast cancer is really not growing very fast, and then you happen to have uh, leukemia, that you should really be in a situation to treat this leukemia. So that part is very convincing and very excited about this. We also saw a very interesting signal because the study actually was powered to demonstrate improvement in survival at 60 days. So we, before we did the study, we computed the survival of patients that have this poor performance, kidney failure, liver failure, etc., without treatment, and it's less than 60 days. So we built a statistical design that said, well, is, do you live longer than 60 days, and does the Borinostat add to the Sacitadine? And our data shows that it does. So this is very interesting. But then what happens is that the curves open in terms of survival and then they close. Then I thought, well, you know, maybe this effect is not so powerful. It took me a little bit to understand what was happening. And then what happens actually is that, of course, these patients have liver disease, heart disease. So many of them, unfortunately, will succumb to their primary disease. Mm -hmm. So my message is, number one, even if you have any of these problems, I strongly believe that with the proper therapy, with the proper uh, support, you can be treated and you should be treated, that you will get clinical benefit. And then I think that this data suggests that the Borinostat adds to the survival of these patients when combined with esacitidine, but the study really is not big or powerful enough to definitively answer this last uh, question. So I'm very interested on this data. We're going to try to like, uh, produce these manuscripts as soon as possible now that they are completed. 
and I think this may resonate a little bit in the community. Uh, I actually thought this was going to be uh, uh, an oral presentation, not just a poster, because I think this is an important message for, for the community. So what do you do next with this? I think this uh, now puts us in a situation where I can be a stronger, for instance, in my own institution, designing clinical trials and saying, like, no, uh, I cannot restrict patients because the creatinine is less than, sorry, is more than two. Maybe I can do three or four or the performance. It's like maybe I don't care about performance. And I think this is message that if we start doing this, you know, of course you have to use clinical sense. And I'm not saying this concept applies for any drug, every situation. But uh, I think this is going to be one of the first studies to really put some uh, emphasis in this issue of treating patients that have other comorbidities, poor performance. Because think about this. If you were trying to give uh, a drug that is really not 100% understood, uh, why you should exclude patients that actually may be the ones who benefit the most from this type of compound. To me, it doesn't make any sense. So we would like to really, and I'm grateful that you are inviting me to give this uh, uh, interview, because I would like to publicize this. You know, of course, we need to write these papers into peer review uh, journals. I think in time, this is going to be important data. Let me ask you, I mean, let's face it, MD Anderson, a leading institution around the world, a global leader in, in, in what you do, um, it, it might be easier for you to just challenge the system with work like this. Do you think patients and do you think the entire system needs more of this type of work where, you, where we say not why or how, but why not? Absolutely. I think that we need to start pushing a little bit um, these rules. I can At see you're levels. passionate about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get many, sorry for interrupting, many times you get, no, you cannot do that because right. it's like, okay, who puts these rules? Well, right. with some uh, modesty, maybe at some point someone needs to start saying, you know, who, I'm sure at some point there were some safety issues with maybe older forms of treatment. But then what happens is that um, these rules get perpetuated, like if it was the Constitution. Now, maybe the Constitution should be changed at some point, but I'm not going there. But, you know, bottom line is that, yeah, these rules at some point, they were probably very important. They had a reason. But now, you know, with the next generation of compounds, these drugs are safe. Uh, they, why are we uh, restricting uh, use of these compounds? And we are, why are we excluding patients that may benefit from these compounds? And what I see in my clinic, actually, is that these patients benefit as much or as less as if you and I that look totally healthy we're going to take these compounds, God forbid. So I commend you for your efforts and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking you must have been a handful as a kid <laughs> saying, why mommy, why not daddy, why, why? Well, <laughs> thank you. Nicely done, sir. Thanks. Yes, sir.